thank you, for, first of all, for inviting me to, to deliver the keynote speech to this fifth annual EU Financial Regulation Conference. Last year was my deputy uh, and colleague, Sean Bergen, and he spoke to you just one day after we had launched the call for evidence uh, and encouraged all interested stakeholders to submit their feedback on our financial services rules. And, uh, and I was very pleased to see that it was extremely effective because many of you did. And we have received uh, more than 300 responses. And uh, Martin, who is uh, in charge of the whole exercise, uh, will, uh, will give you more detail on this. Our analysis is not drawing, now drawing to a close. And uh, next week, as you said, the Commission will do many things in Terralia. It will uh, publish a range of targeted follow-up measures and today I will already share uh, with you a couple of the most important findings. Not all of them, because Vice President Dabrowskis is giving a speech tonight in Bruegel, so we shared the goodies. So, uh, you have to attend both if you want to know everything. Uh, let me first uh, remind you why uh, we consider this exercise as so important. After the financial crisis, we have adopted, and I take every responsibility for this because I was the head of staff of Commissioner Barnier at the time, we have adopted more than 40 pieces of legislation at EU level in five years. And I can tell you that's far too much, at least for poor technocrats. Uh, Legislation to stabilize markets, legislation to recapitalize banks, legislation to restore trust in the financial system. And uh, I strongly believe the result is that today our financial system is stronger and more resilient than it was in 2008. But to do this, we had to legislate very quickly in great haste. And haste is never good. Uh, and uh, in financial services, Every bit and pieces of the financial services sector is depending on the other. I mean, asset managers, impacts on insurances, impacts on banking, uh, banking rules, impact on clearing and settlement, et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically when you try to fix this bit, uh, inadvertently you may impact this and that and that bit. Um, we've been trying to figure out these uh, interactions. Uh, one thing certain is that we have not figured them all out, and uh, it was quite hard to predict all in all how 40 different pieces of regulation would interact and what cumulative impact would be and whether there would be any detrimental unintended consequences. So this is the very reason why we decided last year to launch uh, this call for evidence which is a sort of a substitute to a comprehensive assessment of the regulatory framework that we were not able to complete because it lies on too many assumptions. I mean, what you can quite safely uh, compute is the uh, short-term compliance cost. The short-term overall cost is already a bit more difficult, but the long-term benefits, is uh, you need a crystal ball for that. So it's very, very difficult to, uh, to make a comprehensive assessment of the pros and cons uh, over the long term. So we thought it was much safer and probably more effective as well to try to spot what really, the fatal flows, if you wish, what really doesn't work, what really impedes the working of the market in these interactions that we have not figured out. Of course, some of these ne negative interactions we have figured out we know they exist, and we don't intend to change anything to this. But uh, uh, there are numbers for which they were completely unintended, and for these ones, we uh, want to be able to fix them quickly. Um, so that means having the confidence, basically, to check that our existing rules are working as intended, to be prepared not to change them if they are not exactly working as intended, but there is no fatal flow because we believe after such an overhaul of the regulatory framework, there are, there are benefits in stability. So even if it's not perfect, let's not rush to change everything again because after we will be very badly placed to complain that markets do not invest, uh, we, we need to provide the markets with some stability. 
but also be prepared to change them if there are really unintended detrimental impacts. Uh, this is an approach that is fully supported by the European Parliament. Uh, and the, the call for evidence is probably the first post-G20 agenda uh, international example of such a comprehensive exercise. As you probably know, global standard setters, in particular the FSB, uh, but also the, uh, the Basel Committee are uh, following these examples and are uh, starting to assess the overall uh, coherence and potential unintended consequences of global financial reforms. So, now the piece that you've always been waiting for, what about the stakeholders' feedback and what about the conclusions we draw from it? Uh, the responses show great support for the reforms. Uh, the respondents tend to believe that the reforms have made the system safer and more stable, which is good news because this is what we wanted to do. But at the same time, stakeholders welcomed this exercise as an important step in further improving and fine-tuning the existing regulatory framework. So based on the responses and the discussions during the public hearing uh, that we held here in Brussels right before the summer, uh, we have concluded that overall the regulatory framework uh, for financial services is sound and works as expected. But it's also clear that some targeted changes uh, can make it even more effective in achieving its objectives and there are a number of things that uh, ought to be corrected. So this is why we have committed to addressing such unintended consequences and interactions uh, that were brought to our attention. What we are going to do is proposing concrete actions in those areas where our analysis was able to collect sufficient evidence on the basis of the claims made by market players. Other interesting claims were put forward in areas where we think it's too early to act at this stage or we simply don't have enough evidence. Uh, but we will certainly continue to monitor developments and uh, stand ready to act if we think it becomes necessary. So far, we have identified four key areas uh, for the Commission to take action. Uh, the first one is uh, to continue to ensure that all rules do not impede the flow of finance to the economy. Often, prudential objectives can be achieved in several different ways, and we need to select uh, those ways that are most growth-friendly. Uh, Lord Hill, to which I uh, want to pay tribute for having launched that call for evidence, and he was really very committed to it, uh, used to say that the uh, biggest threat to financial stability in Europe at the moment is lack of growth. That is absolutely true. It is also true that potential regulation can be procyclical, and uh, therefore we have a duty to select the less procyclical ways to attain our objectives. Next week, the Commission will present an important risk of uh, an important package, sorry, of risk reduction proposals for banks. It's widely waited for. It's, if I understood well, completely leaked. Uh, if I read well, Politico this morning, 296 pages. So I think that's the whole thing. Maybe they miss a couple of annexes, but that uh, that is immaterial. So each of you can uh, can make his own opinion. Um, my opinion is that uh, these measures, which are here to implement uh, a good deal of the remaining global reforms, uh, at the same time have been designed in a way to safeguard banks' capacity to finance the economy. Vice President Dombrovsky, as I said at the beginning of this intervention, will discuss more specifically the European banking sector tonight uh, in Bruegels, so I will not expand too much uh, on, on this. What I can tell you is that the measures uh, that we are taking uh, aim also to improve funding opportunities for SMEs. Uh, SMEs are the largest contributor to jobs and growth in Europe. So among other things, uh, our proposal uh, will propose to extend the so-called SME supporting factor 
uh, to all SME loans, and that means, to be clear, including those loans larger than uh, 1.5 million euro. We will also make sure that both banks and insurers have the right incentives to invest in long-term projects, such as, for example, infrastructure. You know that the Commission has already uh, adopted lower risk charges for insurers under Solvency 2 when they invest into qualifying infrastructure projects. We intend to go further and we intend to propose lower risk charges also for infrastructure corporates. In response to concerns that regulation may have contributed to declining market liquidity, there is no hard evidence on this, but it is not completely unlikely, we have launched a comprehensive review of liquidity in corporate bond markets in order to better understand what is happening there. Uh, the first meeting of our newly established expert group was actually held yesterday. So, and you have to rush to Bruegel tonight if you want to know more on banks. Uh, second, we uh, look at the proportionality of the regulatory framework. Uh, we, we strongly believe that we should take greater account of companies' size, business model, and risk profiles when we design rules. Proportionate rules help promote competition by lowering barriers to entry. They also enhance the resilience of the financial system by safeguarding its diversity. Proportionality is already a key part of our regulatory framework because it's a key principle in EU legislation, as you know. Still, we, we think we can do a little bit better. Uh, in order to do this, we intend to review whether different prudential rules should apply to smaller investment firms that pose no systemic threat. And we will explore whether the Solvency II rules on EMEA requirements can be made less burdensome for smaller firms. Um, and that's not rolling over uh, back on the international agenda, as you know, because the international agenda is meant for internationally active firms. And what we're talking about is really whether we need to continue to apply the whole of our rules across the board to everybody uh, in the financial sector, or whether we can have either uh, relief or, or, or more targeted rules or less rules for, for the smallest firms. We will also look uh, at proportionality for asset managers under USITS and AIFMD by assessing, for instance, whether we can align remuneration regimes. Uh, an issue that is dear to the heart of fund managers, as you know. Third, we need to work on removing unnecessary regulatory burdens. Reporting and disclosure requirements are a particular concern for the industry. Uh, for instance, uh, through any duplication across pieces of legislation. And there the Commission uh, is clearly committing, uh, committed to fixing this. Uh, but at the same time, you will understand that we also need to ensure that supervisors have the information they need to perform their duties. So this requires a comprehensive and holistic review of reporting requirements, which the Commission will perform in 2017. The Financial Data Standardization Project aims to develop a common language on financial data through consolidating and streamlining data fields and reporting channels as much as possible. So that would be important in that respect. And some undue compliance costs that don't find their source in EU legislation, but are instead caused by incorrect implementation or additional requirements of so-called gold plating at the national level will also be tackled. We are carrying out a mapping exercise of national transposition measures, and we are preparing a joint roadmap with member states for actions that will help remove national barriers to the cross-border movement of capital. That's a very important part of the exercise that I, I'd like to stop a second on this. You might remember for, for those among you that are, are at least as old as I am that um, in the late 90s, uh, 
uh, the Commission launched the uh, so-called Financial Services Action Plan. And Financial Services Action Plan was about this. It was about dismantling national barriers to the well-functioning of what was called at the time the single market for capital. Uh, that didn't work, and that didn't work because member states in these days still believed they had a choice. I think uh, the sad truth is the economic situation today doesn't offer them much of a choice. I mean, it is absolutely imperative that we have a far better functioning single market for capital, and therefore that member states, in their own interest, in the interest of attracting investment for activity uh, at home, uh, have a critical review of any intended or unintended barrier to cross-border flows of investment. Uh, we're trying to help them in doing this. Uh, we're trying to do it in a way that benchmarks uh, situations in various member states, which they exchange best practices. Uh, we believe this is, this is a way of handling these things that is more effective than bringing forward infringement proceedings. My view is when you have to rely on infringement proceeding, you have largely lost the battle, because that means you failed to convince the member state that he should dismantle uh, the obstacle. That also means uh, that uh, the court will probably tell you 10 years later that you were right. Uh, so it's not a great victory, really. So we're trying to have something a lot more uh, where well, there is more appropriation for the member states and more incentives for them to help us dismantling these barriers. Fourth and finally, uh, we need to look at ways we can make the overall regulatory framework more consistent. Let me give you one example. We learned from the call uh, for evidence that the leverage ratio, which is, as you know, a proposed financial rule, banking rules, could interact with the clearing rules under EMEA. It's something we completely overlooked when we produced the legislation. Actually, the, this is something also the Basel Committee completely overlooked. We have therefore made sure that the leverage ratio would be implemented in a way that does not impact banks' ability to provide clearing services. Because the whole of our policy as a result of the G20 agenda is to move OTC derivatives onto central clearing platforms, so that would be completely contra ratio that we had a banking rules that disincentivize market players or make it complicated or difficult or more expensive to do so. At the same time, the leverage ratio should of course continue to fulfill its duty, which is to provide an effective backstop against excessive leverage. So there's a bit of work here and uh, we'll need to have a constructive dialogue with the BCBS in that respect. None of this work will reduce our focus on strengthening consumer protection and addressing the remaining risks in the financial system. For instance, we will assess whether we should expand the macrofinancial framework beyond banking and whether we need to improve protection under the investor compensation scheme. We also need to keep our regulation up to date with rapid technological change and ensure that our rules are flexible enough to foster technological development rather than impairing it. In that respect, I would simply mention that we launched yesterday uh, a task force uh, dedicated precisely to not only fintechs, but everything that is a crossroad between IT and finance. Uh, and uh, we intend to dedicate a lot of our attention uh, to this, as well as to sustainable finance, increasingly in 2017. So, let me conclude. The call for evidence has underlined the value of evidence-based rulemaking. Uh, it showed also the importance of assessing the combined impact of legislation. It has allowed us to identify and address a great deal of unintended interactions in all rules we were not aware of. We need to ensure that we provide as much regulatory certainty as possible, and the introduction of new rules or changes to exist existing ones should therefore follow a robust process during which we assess the impacts and consult 
relevant stakeholders. We should also refrain, as I said earlier, from the temptation to, to constantly try to perfect the framework, because that's very disturbing for the markets. The findings of the call for evidence are therefore a key input in the many ongoing and forthcoming reviews. Just to take a few examples, on the EMEA review that is uh, coming on, on the IFMD, USITS, Solvency 2. They also fed into the fine tuning of measures that form part of existing work streams, for instance, the CMU action plan. And finally, uh, we have used the result of the call for evidence to better calibrate uh, some of the key level two measures, in particular for MIFID level two. The call for evidence also informed our input in global fora. Of course, the Basel Committee, but also the Financial Stability Board. And it is very encouraging to see uh, that these two bodies have followed the EU's example by launching their own assessment on the overall coherence of global financial reforms. We strongly believe that better regulation principles should be promoted at global level, and the Commission intends to play a leading role in that process. That call for evidence is now or will next week enter into a new phase. Uh, but let me reassure you that it is not going to be a one-off exercise. The principles of better regulation will continue to be applied rigorously by the Commission, whether we develop new rules or review existing ones. We intend to continue to focus on, on assessing the combined impact of our legislation and try to minimize compliance costs, as well as ensure proportionality. But we can't do that alone. And for that reason, we will continue to rely on stakeholders and welcome any further evidence and feedback on how our rules and proposals are working. President Juncker emphasized in this year's State of the Union address that European legislation needs to deliver real added value and results. So I'm pleased that with the call for evidence, we've been able to run a comprehensive checkup in the area of financial services. And uh, I have to thank all of you for your valuable input and assistance in doing so.